But there's a principle of communication that we all need to remember. Often, the most foundational things that people believe are never stated explicitly. Instead, they are assumed. In other words, whenever we have a conversation with someone, or whenever we write a letter or a book, we usually do not explicitly state our most basic shared convictions. Think about this principle for a moment. I have not once said throughout this entire series that I believe in the existence of God. Why not? It's because this belief is so foundational to our lessons that we all assume that I believe in God. I haven't argued that the Bible is the Word of God in this lesson. Why not? Because it's assumed among us. These and many other truths form an implicit foundation for what I have said explicitly. In many ways, the same is true of scriptures. The writers of scripture do not explicitly focus on the most systemic things they're communicating. Those truths underlie what they say explicitly. And one of the goals of systematic theology is to discover the doctrinal assumptions that gave rise to what we find in the scriptures. For example, nowhere in scripture do we find an explicit teaching on the Trinity or on how the two natures of Christ relate to each other in his one person. Both of these doctrines are hallmarks of historical Christianity. These and a host of other very important teachings of Christianity are based in large part on the logical implications of teachings that are scattered throughout the Bible. When systematicians develop doctrines like the Trinity or the natures of Christ, they're not adding to the Bible. Rather, they're seeking to make explicit what already lies beneath the surface of the Bible. For this reason, our exegesis of Scripture can be greatly enhanced by the wisdom that the Church has developed through the centuries as it has used rigorous logical reflection to discern the implications of Scripture. Much of what the Scriptures teach, they never say explicitly. And systematic theology is one of the most helpful tools for uncovering these implicit teachings. As valuable as doctrines and systematics may be for exegesis, we must also become aware of one of the most significant ways they can actually hinder our interpretation of Scripture. In a word, one of the greatest dangers of doctrines and systematic theology is speculation. As we've noted many times, modern systematic theology owes a great debt to medieval scholasticism. But one of the chief characteristics of medieval scholasticism was the assumption that logical analysis can take the church to truths that go far beyond the teachings of Scripture. Many of us have heard one of the speculative questions that preoccupy medieval theologians. How many angels can dance on the head of a pen? Now, because Protestant systematics is so greatly indebted to scholastic theology, it too sometimes strays into speculation. It also explores ideas and reaches conclusions for which there is very little or no biblical support simply because these conclusions seem logical. For instance, you might be surprised to know that in traditional Protestant systematic theology, great debates have raged over the very speculative matter called the lapsarian question. Perhaps you've heard the terms supralapsarianism, infralapsarianism, and sublapsarianism, or several other variations. Heated debates have occurred between advocates of these positions. And the entire debate amounts to this question. In what logical order should we conceive of God's eternal decrees? That's right, the logical order of the eternal decrees of God, His eternal plan for the universe. Now I hope that everyone realizes that the Bible does not even come close to addressing this issue. It's one of those great mysteries about which the Bible gives us next to no information. But an overly enthusiastic endorsement of logical analysis and doctrinal discussions can lead to this and many other speculations.
As we learn how to apply logical reflection to develop doctrines out of Scripture, we would all be wise to remember those well-known words of Moses in Deuteronomy chapter 29, verse 29. The secret things belong to the Lord our God, but the things revealed belong to us and to our children forever, that we may follow all the words of this law. There are secret things, mysteries, that have not been revealed to us, so careful logical reflection often leads us to speculation. As we interpret the scriptures in the process of doctrinal discussions, we must always remind ourselves not to stray too far from what the scriptures actually teach. We must constantly ask ourselves at each step, what evidence from the Bible supports this doctrine? Regularly substituting logical speculation for scriptural support will undoubtedly hinder our exegesis of scripture. In this lesson, we've explored doctrines in systematic theology. We've seen what they are and how they fit into systematic theology. We've also explored how doctrines are formed. And we've looked at a number of the values and dangers they present. All Christians have doctrines they believe, whether they've been written down or simply taught by word of mouth. But learning how systematic theologians have formed Christian doctrines through the centuries is one of the best ways for us to evaluate what we already believe and to further our understanding of God's Word as we serve Him and as we serve His people.